I have to be real careful with this message because I am a minister. And I'm going to be saying some things this morning about ministers. And so what I'm going to be saying to them, I'm saying to myself also because I don't want it to look like that I'm pontificating. I don't want it to look like that at all because I am a minister right along with all the rest of the ministers. I certainly don't do everything right by any means, but I really strive to do what the Lord wants me to do. I keep that before me all the time. Anytime I ever uh, get prepared to have a message to preach, I always say, Lord, I hope you're pleased with this. And I hope this helps your people. That's the criteria for me to preach. I've never been a company man. I've never been, although I'm with the Assemblies of God, I've never been a company man where I try to please my denomination. I love the Assemblies of God and I respect them and I love my leadership, always have. But I'm not one of those type of people that's trying to climb a ladder and become an official with Assemblies. I'm not one of those people. I'm not a politically correct preacher. Never have been and never will be. <laughs> never will be. <clears throat> You know, I really look at the ministry as simple, as very simple. It's just me and the Lord, and I have, I have a few friends that I have around me in the ministry that I love, and we talk. That circle is probably not as big as you think it is. And there's people that I, that I look at as my spiritual sons and daughters in the Lord, and we talk some also. But basically, I look at being in the ministry as a one-on-one -on -one thing with just me and Jesus. And um, I try to preach the word. You know, you'll notice as I come to you every week, I always come to you with plenty of scriptures, and I always tell you that the word will preach itself, and it does. I love people. I think of people all the time. I think about their souls. I think about where they're going. And I know that in a large part, in some cases, I have a lot to do with where people go because they have to hear truth. And also... Part of my job sometimes is to confront people that I feel like is on a wrong road and I take a risk and I'll say, if you continue on this road, I think you're going to be in trouble and I think you may wind up in hell. And I'll tell people that, not because I want to tell them, but because I feel like the Lord would have me to tell them. So being in the ministry is a, to me is a very, very serious thing. I enjoy being in the ministry. I like to laugh, I like to have fun, but then there's times that I like to come before you and I have to be serious. And today's one of those days. Today I have to come before you and I have to be serious. Some of the things I'm going to say today may sound political, but they're not meant to be political. They're only meant to be an observation of where I feel like things are. It's not a Democrat or Republican thing. It's just an observation. So with that said, I want you to look with me, if you will, please, as you stand. I'm going to read two passages of Scripture. I'm going to read uh, Isaiah chapter 21 and verse 6. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen in the King James Version. And then I'm also going to be reading in 2 Peter chapter 3. And um, that'll be on the screen also. Um, you'll see whenever I put scriptures on the screen, it will either say King James Version or either it will say NIV, which is a new, or, or RSV, which is a Revised Standard Version, NIV, excuse me, is a new international version, maybe the Living Bible. I have a Bible at home that's about that thick, and I can look at every page in the Bible on one page and see all different renditions of how that scripture is. There, I like the NIV a good bit. I really like the Revised Standard, but I think the, my favorite is the Amplified Bible. But the Amplified is so wordy, I have to be careful because I'm wordy too, and we'll be here all day long. Amen. But in Isaiah chapter 21 and verse 6, it says, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go and set a watchman and let him declare what he sees. That's Isaiah 21 and verse 6. The Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman and let him declare what he sees. Look this way, please, real quickly before I change and read something else. Ministers of God if they're a pastor, an evangelist, whoever they may be, prophets. We are called to watch, and we are called to report what we see. 
Now, the Bible says that God won't do anything unless first he shows his servants the prophets. In other words, he won't do anything, the Bible says anything, except first he will show the prophets. Now, when I told you that a while ago about that earthquake, I didn't tell you that to impress you, but I told you that because it encouraged me that I heard. It doesn't make any difference what you think about me or, you know, coming back after the fact. That doesn't matter. I just know it encouraged me that I heard and I saw it the next day and I said, wow, you know. So it encouraged me that I'm hearing. The next passage of Scripture is a rather lengthy passage. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 11. It says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. How many of you would say we're in a day where there's scoffers? How many of you have a rough time sometimes trying to talk to people about the coming of Jesus? How many of you have recognized they really don't want to hear it? Even church people. Even church people. I'm not talking about church of his presence, but I'm talking about just people. They don't want to hear it. But the Bible said in the last days, it says, know this first. Look at how he says that. Know this first. He said, there will come in the last days. What days are these? The last days. Scoffers, and it said they'll be walking after their own lust. And they will be saying, where's the promise of his coming? You know, since the fathers fell asleep, in other words, historically, everything has continued as from the beginning of creation. And they will say, or the Bible says that they are willingly ignorant. Now, I like that passage because it says they're not ignorant. It says they are willingly deceiving themselves and they are willingly ignorant. In other words, they are refusing all information that could help them to know where we are, but they're willfully ignorant. They're just not looking at it. Amen? And it says they're willfully ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was overflowed with water and it perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, and the next time the earth is going to be destroyed, it will be destroyed by fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men would count slackness. But he is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But it says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? You may be seated. This is not going to take 30 minutes. There's, there's no really good place to start here today. This is one of those messages that you could just sort of poke in the dark and just start there. There's no real good starting place. There's no real good ending place. And what I'm going to say here today, I feel totally inadequate to say it. This is one time when I get up like this that I don't really feel good about that I'm going to do good as far as telling you what's on my heart. Because this is such a big subject, I feel inadequate. I was praying, as I always do every week, and I ask God what you want me to speak on tomorrow. And especially as I end these messages on Bible prophecy, these three messages, Psalms 83, Ezekiel uh, 37, 38, and then what I dealt with last week about Iraq. And as I was asking the Lord what he wanted me to deal with, Here's what the Holy Spirit said. He said, I have many ministers and they are speaking on my behalf. But he said, they're not saying it like I would say it. He said, what's missing is the urgency in their voice. 
today, and I have to put myself in the same category, when ministers speak today, here's what you're picking up on. You're picking up on men that's looked at successful ministers and ministries that has lots of people, hundreds and thousands of people. And young ministers are looking at those guys and they're trying to emulate them because they want big churches themselves. So many times, many times, not in all cases, but many times these mega churches, as I said, not in every case, but sometimes, these mega churches are really cognizant not to offend people, not to preach anything that will make anybody uncomfortable. And they're really careful when they get up to preach to people that everybody leaves out of there feeling really good, you know. And so when you see young preachers that's just out of Bible school or maybe they've been pastoring three, four, five years and they want their church to grow, they're looking at these guys that's got a big church already and so they're trying to emulate them and they're trying to follow their procedures. And what you find today is many preachers have become less like a man of God and more like a lecturer. And they have become, matter of fact, they've changed their titles now where the Bible says that God's given a fivefold gifting, pastor, teacher, evangelist, apostle, and prophet. Now, preachers now don't like that title anymore, pastor, that God gave us, and they call themselves, uh, they call themselves um, lead minister. Or they call themselves life counselor. That's what they call themselves. They've replaced the terminology that God gives us with terms like life counselors, life coach, that's right, life coaches. And um, they don't like those terms because they don't want it to come across that they're, you know, preaching the word of God. They like to be more secular but yet still be sort of spiritual. You know what I'm saying? They like that, they like that um, secular feel to it. And when people come in, there in many cases is no preaching with any kind of urgency whatsoever. Now you know as well as I do that whenever people come together, whether they're watching a TBN or people are watching Daystar or they're watching John Hagee on television or whoever they're watching, you know as well as I do that some people will be watching those programs for the last time and they won't never face another tomorrow. Some will be killed, some will die, and there has to always, we have to remember, there has to always be a sense of urgency in our preaching to let people know you might not make it till tomorrow. My pastor always told me this. My pastor always raised me and told me this. He said, son, a man may tie his shoes in the morning, but the undertaker may untie them that night. We're not promised tomorrow. And whenever we preach, we've got to preach with an urgency in our voice that we need to be right with God if anything should happen to us. You can't, you can't lead people to believe that everything is going to be fine and everything's going to rock on like it always has because you know as well as I do, it's not going to rock on as it always has. There's things right now in motion that may change our nation almost overnight and for me to stand here and act like everything's all right, I can't do that. Our president may do that, but I can't do that. I can't do that. The politicians in Washington may can do that and lead you to believe that everything's going to be okay, but in the house of God, there's got to arise a siren that says, blast, 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 attention, attention, attention. Things are changing and they're changing quickly. Come on, help me. And here's what God said. He said, tell the watchman, set them up on the wall. In other words, put them up in a place. You know, one of the things that happens to preachers is when they get put up on a pedestal, they can't take it because they feel above the people. Listen, if God ever puts a man of God above the people, it means he's got a servant's heart. And if you go down and you become a servant, God can elevate you and put you up. But if you haven't been humble, and if you don't have an humble spirit, 
and you go up, you're going to start lording it over God's heritage. And you're going to think that people's looking to you because of who you are. Friend, let me tell you something. We, all of us ministers, has got to understand something. And that is, if God's done anything in us, it's not anything we've done. It's by the grace of God that God has done what he's done. It's by the grace of God. We've got to stop coddling our preachers and putting them in elevated positions because the flesh is not built to take that. And when that kind of stuff begins to happen, there needs to be fasting and prayer in that man or woman's life. Fasting will take you down quicker than anything I can think of. But you talk about fasting today in most churches, they want to talk about weight loss. I'm not talking about weight loss. I'm talking about humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that God might elevate us and lift us up and use us in this hour. Paul was always amazed, the Bible says, that God put him in the ministry. And I have to be honest with you and tell you, I have to be honest with you and tell you, it is only a miracle that God put me in the ministry. When I first gave a book report in school, I couldn't do it. I was so humiliated. I, it seemed like it was the fifth or sixth grade, and I had to get up, and they called my name, and I had to get up and give my book report. I was so nervous. My heart was beating so hard, I was hyperventilating, and I couldn't get my breath, and I had to sit down in defeat. And for a long time after that, I was totally whipped and intimidated, totally. When I was 14, God called me to preach. And whenever the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit and called me to preach, I still was scared to death. You've heard me say this before, but I got a preaching engagement over in Alabama in Phoenix City, across the river from Columbus, my hometown, and the pastor got me a speaking engagement on a Wednesday night. And I went over there and drove over and was going to preach that night, have my sermon notes in my Bible, and I saw that big crowd around that church, and I got so scared I drove away. <laughs> drove away, left the preacher high and dry, and he had to preach with no notes or anything. And pastor said to me, what happened? And I was so scared I couldn't even tell my own pastor that I was just so scared I couldn't do it. So I want you to understand something. There's nothing inherent in me at all that qualifies me to be a preacher except the grace of God. And that's the truth. That's the truth. When I first took my first church, when Brenda heard me preach, we were married when she first heard me preach. <laughs> I got a preaching engagement at a place called Ashburn, Georgia, a small town near Jimmy Carter's hometown of Plains. We went over on Sunday morning, and it was a small church, and they had windows raised in the church, and it was hot. And I got up to preach, and I said, friend, don't even, don't, I wouldn't even dignify it by calling it preaching. It was pitiful. I got up, and I was just talking, and I was rambling. And it was so bad that I tried to get a little bit of volume going, thinking, well, this is where the pastor preaches. And so I tried to get a little bit of volume going, and it was just a sounding brass and a tingling cymbal. And I, and I sucked in when I was really going good. I sucked in a fly. <laughs> And he was in my throat, tickling me, crawling up and down my esophagus. And I said to the congregation, excuse me a minute. And I went over to the raised window and I said. <laughs> and I came back and said, as I was saying. <laughs> when we got in the car that morning. We, nobody even invited us out to eat. I think we were supposed to go, you know, and eat with some people after service, you know, board members. And it was so bad, nobody even invited us out to eat. And Brenda got in the car and she couldn't help it. You know, she couldn't help it. You know, Brenda, Sister Honest. And she looked at me and she said, Honey, I love you. I'm married to you, but all. But she said, Are you sure you're called to preach? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, but it wasn't until I took my first church 
And I was scared to death to take my first church. I was scared out of my mind. District superintendent set it up and forced me to go. And he said, John, I've set it up. You're going. He gave me no choice. And I went down there, and I preached that first message at my church in Vidalia, Georgia, in 1970. My oldest son was just born. I was right out of Bible school. I was so scared. And I got up that morning to preach. And when I got up behind that pulpit that Sunday morning, I knew they was going to vote on me that night. When I stood up to preach, I felt something come over me like a warm glove. Just like a warm glove. And I felt as at home behind the pulpit as I do at home in my recliner. And I felt tingling go over me like this. And that night I came back. Now, when I got in the car that morning, and Brenda said, wow, that's, that's pretty good. Wow. So that night, they, uh, I, I got up to preach, and I preached so hard under such an anointing. I'd never preached an anointing like that. Preached under such a power and such an anointing. I shouted, just stomped and shouted so hard. I was skinny in those days. And my wedding band came off and rolled up under the pew. So while everybody went back to the back to the fellowship hall to vote, Assembly God votes on everything, you know. They went back to vote. I was down on my hands and knees under the pews looking for my wedding band. And I found it. And they came back and they said, well, pastor, welcome to Bidea, Georgia. And I got voted in. And from that day forth, I've never felt that glove of anointing lift off of me. So it's the presence of the Lord. And I want to say this to you. Whenever God calls you, those that he calls, he anoints. And where God guides, he provides. And my ministry took off from that day forward. I wasn't called to be an evangelist. I was called to be a pastor. And when I fit in that mold and the anointing came on me, my mind stretched. I could feel my mind stretching every week. I could just feel my mind stretching. I could feel my inner man growing. Every time I got ready to study, I'm saying this for the benefit of a lot of people watching my television, I know, a lot of ministers. But I would study, and I'd look forward to my study time, and as I began to study, sometime it would take 12 hours for me to get one message. Sometime it'd take three days for me to get one message. Sometime it'd take two hours. I have walked from the place on the platform where I was sitting in my first church to the pulpit and not have a message and just be scared out of my mind because I studied for days and still couldn't get anything. And when I was walking from my chair to the pulpit, a message came down low, and I got up and preached like I'd been studying for days. And it was something I didn't even know. So it was just the Holy Spirit. And so whenever you realize that God puts you in the ministry and he anoints you and he gives you what he wants you to say, you realize you better do what he tells you to do because he's the one that's in control, not me. So... As I stand here today to, to talk to you, I want to tell you that the thing that the Holy Spirit said to me that's missing today is that his ministers are not saying things like he would say them. He said, I would have a sense of urgency. He said, the sense of urgency has gone out of the pulpits of America. Everything is real calm. Everything is like a lecture. It's deliberate. There's no room for the Holy Spirit to anoint. There's no manifestations of the presence of God. There's no manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. There's no evident presence of the Holy Spirit. And when the word is preached, there's no opportunity for God to move in the people and to convict people of their sins and to lead people in a sinner's prayer. It's just that you can have saint out there or so-called Christian out there. Everybody leaves the same, but nobody's challenged. And in the very hour that we're living in, we've never been this place before ever in the church, church age. And in this hour that we're living in, preachers refuse to preach on the coming of Jesus Christ. They say it's too controversial. They will say that, well, some people may believe in the rapture and others may not believe in the rapture, so I don't want to offend people. You better start preaching what God gives you to preach. I better start preaching what God gives me to preach. 
I'm not left to choose what I'm going to preach. I'm supposed to settle this pulpit, open my mouth and cry out and tell people what God is saying in this hour. Are you listening? And the Bible says this. He says he's called the watchman to declare what they see. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, it says this. Look at it. Son of man, I have made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. God said, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. He said, I have made you a watchman. God has called pastors in this hour and he's made them watchmen. Now, the one thing I'll say is this. There's not many preachers that I see today that's really preaching on the coming of Jesus Christ. I commend John Hagee because that's how he's known. I commend Perry Stone. That's what he's known for. But your average pastors in many of your churches across this nation, even mega churches, they're just not dealing with current issues that points to the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And you know what? If we don't tell people what they need to hear, God's going to hold us accountable and their blood will be on our hands. Do you think I can get up this morning and preach about Zacchaeus up the tree? Zacchaeus up the tree is important. But right now is not time to talk about Zacchaeus up the tree. Right now it's time to talk about the seriousness of the times that we're living in. Here's what he says. God's sending his watchman right now, and he's saying, as I just read to you in verse 17, it says, give them warning from me. How many preachers do you hear today that's giving warning? Warning. Warning. Red light, red light, red light. How many preachers do you hear today? It doesn't bother me at all to cut on Christian television and to see a man get up with the right spirit and give a warning from God to people about the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, I'll sit there and amen him and I'll weep with him. A warning doesn't bother me. I remember one time, I, I used to fish a lot. When I pastored in Georgia, I used to fish a lot at uh, Steenahatchee, Florida. And me and some of the guys in the church would go down after church on Wednesday night. We'd drive all night and we'd get down to Steenahatchee, which is... Um, east of Tallahassee and we would uh, go out early in the morning right at daybreak and we'd fish. We'd fish for speckled trout and it was called the flats. You could jump out of the boat miles out in the water and it wouldn't be but just like waist deep, maybe at the top of my legs, waist deep. And we'd fish and I mean we'd just rake them in. Had such fun. But I remember I had to leave the, the group one day because we'd travel down there in groups, you know, and I, I could fish one day, but I had to get home the next day because I had a funeral. So I drove, after I got through fishing all day and hadn't slept the night before, I drove home and was tired. And I set my cruise control on my Oldsmobile on I-75 going up toward Georgia, toward Macon. I set my cruise control at 70, 75. And as I was headed home, it was getting dark. And I was so tired, I was in a stupor. I was so tired that I couldn't keep my eyes open, and I was sort of in a stupor. I was listening to the radio, but I saw this truck up ahead of me, and it was a watermelon truck. It was an old truck, and it was going probably 50 miles an hour. It was in the slow lane of I-75, and it was loaded down with watermelons, and I'm speeding up on it. And I know I'm speeding up on it. I see it but I'm so tired I can't do anything about it. I'm speeding up on it. And right before I got to that watermelon truck and what was going to hit it, I, I come out of my sleep and I snatched the steering wheel like that, almost flipped my car. And I, and I went around him. And I had to pull off the road. My heart was beating so hard. And when I pulled off the side of the road, here's what the Holy Spirit said. He said, I just gave you a perfect example of spiritual sleep. He said, you saw danger coming, but you couldn't do anything about it. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? He said, if you'd had somebody in the car with you, in the front seat, they could have said, Pastor? And their voice would have brought me back to reality. But because I was by myself, 
I couldn't, I couldn't grasp the danger that I was about to be killed possibly or severely injured. And I was racing right toward that watermelon truck and I couldn't do anything about it. I was in a stupor. And the Holy Spirit said, my people are also in a stupor, but they need somebody to cry out with urgency in their voice. And, and the Lord said, if somebody would have been in the front seat, they could have said, watch out, our pastor. And, and I wouldn't have gone that way. It would have been something that I could have slowed down and wouldn't have almost had that accident. And so that's what I'm saying to you today. We've got to have preachers in the pulpit that will say, watch out, warning, warning, red light, warning. And you know what? If people don't have that ability to hear it from the pulpit, I've got a question for you. Where are they going to hear it? Where are they going to hear it? If you don't hear it in the house of God, people know. Listen, people know today. They're not stupid. They know something's going on. They know something's going on in the Middle East. They know something's going on in Iraq, in Iran, in Damascus. They know about Iran. They know about all that nuclear power stuff. They know about everything that's going on in the Middle East. They know something's happening, but the preachers are not talking about it. And they're asking all kinds of questions. They're even talking among themselves. And people that's not even scripturally literate are trying to answer these things and they're missing in a million miles. And God's saying to the preachers, get up and tell them. Get up and warn them. If you don't warn them, who will? I love this. Luke 21, verses 32 through 36, it says, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is Jesus speaking. He said, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged, overloaded with partying, surfeiting means partying, and drunkenness, and the cares of this life so that that day come upon you unaware. Look this way, everybody. What Jesus is saying is that day can creep up on you. Amen. He said it comes as a thief in the night. He said it can creep up on you. He said, lest that day come on you and creep up on you and catch you unaware. It says, the next verse, as a snare, it will come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. The Bible says it'll come upon everybody as a snare on the whole earth. The pulpits are going to be so silent that it's going to creep up. The devil's got preachers with lockjaw. They can preach on money. They can preach on church growth. They can raise money for buildings and all this kind of stuff, but they can't get up and say where we really are in God's plan for the ages. And the Bible said it'll creep up on people. It'll just sort of sneak up on them unaware as a snare, and a snare means you're trapped. You can't get out of it. And it says this, watch therefore. This is what Jesus said. He said, watch. Therefore, watch. You know what? When you get together after service with other church people, you don't need to be talking about if the preacher preached good or preacher preached bad. You need to start talking about the signs of the times and how Jesus is about to come. You don't need to be talking about your children or your grandchildren or your relatives. You don't need to be talking about Obama. You don't need to be talking about Democrats or Republicans. You need to be talking about the, the Lord's coming is right at the door. Order your conversation and start speaking about things that has eternal substance. Much of the stuff that people talk about when they get together, Alabama football and all that kind of stuff, I'm not against that. I like it myself. It's not time for that. It's time to talk about what God's doing. You want to get in trouble? You want to get in trouble as a preacher? Just say anything negative against sports, especially football, and people will ostracize you. I love Saban, and I love Alabama football, and I love all that stuff, and I watch it myself. But right now, that'll take care of itself. There's more important things at hand. That's a good place for you to say amen. Woo. I can tell I got some saving ice in here today. <laughs> Bible says, watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape 
all these things that shall come to pass and to be able to stand before the Son of Man. Look at this. In verse of Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, it says, watch, stand fast in the faith, quit yourselves. In other words, get your stamina as a man and not as a child. Quit talking about childish things. Quit sniveling and crying and whining. Be men. Be men. Start teaching your children. Start teaching your grandchildren. Start talking to your wife about things that's sober. The Bible says be strong. If I have ever seen anything in my life that's needed today, it's for men to be strong in the Lord. I see so many women that's carrying the load spiritually and financially in so many homes around this nation. It's time for the men to get control and to be men and to take spiritual responsibility for their wives and for their families and begin to give direction and leadership to their families about spiritual things. You know, one of the things that happens is so many times when you see what's going on in the world, we have a tendency, to, we, we want to we go, we we go political right off the bat. We see things that's happening. Well, ISIS, okay. Well, Obama didn't warn us in enough time. And we want to go political. And, and you know, it was this and it was that. The Pentagon didn't have the right kind of intelligence. The CIA didn't do their job. All that is secondary. That's secondary. That's just guessing and stabbing in the dark. You don't know everything. You don't know. You don't know everything. You want to get political. It's not time to get political. It's time to get spiritual spiritual and to begin to measure what's going on in the world by spiritual yardsticks in the scripture you can take a spiritual yardstick right now and begin to measure the signs of the times and they point straight up toward the coming of Jesus Christ you know that listen I'm not telling you anything new here today you know that I'm just coming here today to remind you we need to be reminded let me say this to you. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 29 through 32, it says this. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. This is the Apostle Paul. He said, feed the church of God. Feed them. In other words, that's what I do every week. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm feeding you. The Bible says, feed the church which Christ purchased with his own blood. Look this way, everybody, just for a minute. Let me before I leave that. I never let it leave my mind that you're not my people. I hear pastors talk about how the church is their church, and those are my people. You're not my people. You're God's people. You're God's heritage. You are betrothed and engaged to Jesus Christ. My job is to encourage you to educate you, to impart knowledge to you, to strengthen you, but never to look at you like you're my people. I'm your pastor, but you're not my people. You are God's people. You understand that? And when we get moved over there on Highway 181 and that church, that's not my church. I'll die one day or I'll retire one day and somebody else will take that pulpit and you'll never miss a lick. You're not my people, it's not my church. I'm just feeling a place right now. We get so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. Are you listening to me? I don't know about you, but I just feel like I needed to say some of these things today. This is not my church. You're not my people. You're a part of my congregation or the congregation of the Lord, but it's God's people. It's God's church. And I'm just the person he's chosen to help you and to strengthen you and to feed you. But look at this. It says, feed the flock. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer. Feed the church which you purchased with his own blood. I know this, that after my departing, wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Here again the Bible says, what? In other words, pastors are to be watchmen. 
Watch for wolves. You know what? In many churches today, if preachers stood up and said, there's people that's coming in this church and they're exactly like a wolf. The devil's trying to tear this church up. It would make people so mad they'd want to get rid of the pastor. But God has not called us to be that kind of a conscientious person that we're afraid we're going to offend you. We've got to tell you if it offends you or not. We've got to tell you. Let me ask you this. Why have we become so sensitive to God anointing a man to tell you things you need to hear? Why have we become so hypersensitive about those things? It says, watch therefore. Remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. He was saying, I cried and I warned you and told you that wolves was coming. And he said, now, brethren, I commend you to God. In other words, I got to leave. I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. He said, watch. He said, I see wolves coming. And they're going to come in and they're going to try to tear up the flock. So not only is a minister supposed to warn about the coming of Christ, but the minister is supposed to warn the congregation about people that's in the congregation that's there, sent by the devil to tear the church up. And it's so alien anymore for a preacher to do that that people think, oh my God, I'm going to find another church. That's a strange church. No, you just got a man of God that's saying, be careful. Y'all remember the old, those of you that was in revival? Steve's last message he preached in the Brownsville revival was wolves. He preached on wolves. He had a stuffed wolf there. And he said, the wolves are coming. They always have. And they always will. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm going to tell you about them. I'm going to tell you about them. Let me say something else while I'm speaking. Just hear me. When we get moved in our new church, please don't let a new church change you. Please don't get into a new church and think, well, we've got to calm down now because we've got all kind of new people coming in and we're going to have to behave our... Listen. We're going to have to behave ourselves now. Because now we got, oh, I saw attorney so-and-so here, and, and I saw so-and-so here. Listen, if y'all think that's going to change me, go ahead and vote me out now and get you another one. That's not going to change me. It's not that we act like idiots. It's not that we're trying to drive people away, but I'm just saying we're going to let God be God and let him have his way. If it, if it's truly a church of his presence and people seize that when they pull in the gate, church of his presence, they've got to know this is not an ordinary church. It is a church of his presence. And I have this feeling. I remember Jan, uh, Jan with TBN, Jan Crouch told years ago, uh, her father was Brother Bethany. He used to be my pastor for a while, many years ago at North Highland when I went there for just a brief season. He was a powerful preacher of the gospel, Edgar Bethany. And I remember he left and went to Atlanta and started a church up there. But Ed, Edgar Bethany, one time I saw him in a restroom and we were just chatting in between services and he looked at me as an old man and he looked at me as a, as a young preacher and he said, son, he said, understand something. He said, when the rich people come to your church, when the doctors and the lawyers and all the professional people come to your church, he said, don't ever be intimidated by that because he said, they have needs just like the garbage collector does sitting on the same seat. He said, they have needs. They're hungry for God just like anybody else is hungry for God. And he said, don't get that on your mind. Don't let that play on your mind. He said, when you get up to preach, you got to preach to everybody in the house as though they're the sheep of God and the flock of God. No big eyes and no little use. He said, do you understand me? I said, yes, sir. And I never forgot that. He said, the super wealthy... The politicians, the professional people, they have needs just like everybody else, and that's why they're there. They're hungry and they're seeking. Don't go and try to conform everything to them. 
I remember when I pastored, left Georgia, and I took a church in Indiana. <laughs> I followed Hansel Vibert, and he had been there 33 years at Calvary Temple in Evansville. It was the first church in the Assemblies of God to ever run a 1,000. <laughs> Brother Vibert said in the early years when he was trying to build a church, he said he just, you know, had people. It started in the old stable. The church started in the old stable up there. Had no money. He started it right after the days of the Depression. Nobody had nothing. In an old stable. He said flies and all kinds of stuff, you know, just oil lamps. So he said finally whenever they built Calvary Temple downtown on Main Street, he said the church began to grow and he said he was going to the certain dentist and the dentist was really a, a sharp guy, you know, and really astute and uh, Brother Vibbert invited him to the church and so he came and it was on a Sunday night and uh, he had a real powerful Pentecostal church but you know, as well as I do back in those days of Pentecost, a lot of people had certain strange manifestations. So the dentist and his wife came in and their little children, they sat on the pew toward the back. And uh, Brother Vibbert got up and he said he tried to get a hold of the service real early so when they started singing that the old saints wouldn't start shouting and, you know, and all that stuff. He said we had to keep all that because we got the dentist here tonight. <laughs> and he said all of a sudden the Spirit of God got to move and he couldn't control it during the worship service and he said, um, Sister So-and-so, I, I can't remember her name now. He said, Sister So-and-so. So she started, <laughs> and then she would, you know, just, and she'd just jump up and down like, a, like she's in a popcorn maker, just jump up and down. <laughs> and he said, when the Holy Spirit really got to move, and said she, start, she, would, she would leave her seat, and she'd start going down the aisle backwards. And he said, that night, she really got under it heavy. And she started going down the aisle backwards. And he said, oh, Jesus, if you've ever helped me, help me now. He said, Lord, don't let her go back there. Anywhere near that dentist, do you hear me, Holy Spirit? And he said, while everybody was standing and worshiping, the dentist and his family was sitting down just looking in horror. And he said, when Sister So-and-So got back there, said she went right in the aisle where they were sitting and tripped over his feet and fell right in his lap. And he said, oh, God, it's over now, Lord. It's run ruined. It's over now. And uh, he said, he went on that night and tried to preach. He said, I can't remember what I preached. He said, it was a fiasco of a service. He said, I went home. And he said, it was, oh, I said, I was so worried. I was just sick. And he said, I went home that night. I didn't sleep all night long. He said, next morning at 730, my phone rang, and it was the dentist. And he said, oh, my God. When I heard his voice, I thought, oh, Lord. And he said, oh, Pastor Vibbert, he said, I hadn't been able to sleep all night. And I, Brother Vibbert said, hey, I guess you haven't. <laughs> he said, but you know, last night we come in and he said, when all that stuff started up and people were singing and he said, I just felt something I'd never felt before. And he said, when that precious little woman started jumping up and down and bouncing up and down, he said, I just had tears running down my face. And he said, I said to myself, if this is really real, send her back here to us. Come on, church. If this is really real, send her back here. I want some of that. <laughs> and Brother Vibbert said this. He said, I learned early that when people come into your church, no matter who they are, no matter if they have a name, if they have notoriety, if they have money, whatever, people are looking for the same thing when they come to the house of God. Lord, if you're real, would you touch me? Would you meet with me? Would you touch my family? And I want to say this to Church of His Presence, don't ever get too big for your britches that we can't let God be God in Church of His Presence. Go ahead and praise Him. It's okay. One, one guy came to the church one night. 
wealthy man, Brother Vibbert told me, he said, <clears throat> just an extremely wealthy man, and he said, somebody got up, it's a lot like Ward does sometime, you know, here, and uh, before the pastor got to the pulpit, and he saw this notor- man of notoriety back there in the back of his family, and the pastor thought, oh God, let everything go well, Lord. Let everything go well. Let him be impressed so he'll come back. So he said that night, whoever got up before the pastor said, I just feel like we need to turn right now and ask the person behind you if they're ready for heaven, if they're ready to go to heaven. And he said, sitting right in front of this man of notoriety was a mentally unstable young man. (laughs) That he'd been in the church for years. <laughs> you know, he just couldn't help it, bless his heart, but he was mentally unstable, and everybody there loved him and knew him, and, you know, they pitied him, that type of thing, and he, he just was loved by there, but he just had, you know, he was mentally unstable. He was sort of retarded. And so he said, just turn to the person behind you and ask them, do you want to go to heaven? Are you ready to go to heaven? And so the young man turned around to this man of notoriety, and he said, You want to go to heaven? And the man said, no. He said, well, go to hell then. (laughs) He got up and stormed out of the church. Pastor saw it. Pastor got up to preach that night. He was wilted like a lily. He wanted to preach so bad, you know, and wanted to impress this man with his sermon, but little Bobby got a hold of him before Pastor got a hold of him. Little Bobby had done his business. So the man jumped up and stormed out of the church. The next morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, he called the pastor. Pastor Vibbert, this is so-and-so. He said, yes. He said, I want to tell you, last night I was in service. And he said, that little retarded boy turned around to me and said, you want to go to heaven? And I said, no. And he said, well, go to hell then. He said, I've been, I can't get it off my mind all night. He said, would you pray with me to receive Jesus this morning? (laughs) Come on, church. Here's here's what I'm trying to say to you. I think this is what I'm trying to say to you. I don't think you have to have that kind of a church for people to be healthy spiritually. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying you can be so politically and so correct in every way that the Holy Spirit don't have any avenues to reach people. Let's be a church where God can reach people a hundred different ways while they're there. In the Brownsville Revival, we had people come in, millionaires and billionaires. We had senators, congressmen. We had prime ministers from other countries. We had delegates to the United Nations. They all came through Brownsville. I had a congressman call me from Pensacola when the papers was just raking us over the coals, me and Steve, and he said, Brother John, he said, don't let that mullet rapper bother you. He said, that church is highly respected. He said, you and Steve are highly respected among the nations. And I said, well, thank you so much. He said, no, listen, he said, I have delegations of people come in from all over the world to Capitol Hill. And he said, the first thing they know I'm from Pensacola is Joe Scarborough. And he said, they know I'm from Pensacola and they know I was a congressman. And they said, come here, come here. And they'd get me off in a room away from all the other people standing around. They said, tell me about that revival in Pensacola. Tell me about it. And he said, I'll start telling them about the revival in Pensacola. And he said, man, they'll start weeping. How can I get there? How can I get there? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. People are hungry. People are asking questions. People are inquisitive. And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear without a preacher? It's not my eloquence, because I'm not an eloquent man. It's not my eloquence. 
and I'm not a person that's brilliant, no, uh, anything like that. It's just that God knows I'll obey. And I'll tell what he tells me to tell. And I won't tell what he tells me not to tell. That's just the bottom line. And what God wants his ministers to be is his, not the congregation's. God wants the ministers to be his, not the people's. Let me give you this real quick and I'm going to close. True watchmen in the Bible are not watching out for their own interest. They're watching out for God's interest. For example, the test of a holy watchman and a true watchman is they don't watch out for their own ambitions and their own interests. They watch out for people's souls. They watch out for people's souls. You see, every time I come out here, and I, I think you need to hear me talk like this occasionally, Every time I come out here, I realize <clears throat> your body's going to die and mine's going to die. So my, my real emphasis is not so much on your body. My real emphasis is your soul. Your soul. I'm just passing through, and so are you. Just passing through. And my job as a minister is to watch out for your soul. Somebody, I get letters from people all the time. They say, oh, Brother Phil Patrick, we appreciate you being so faithful through the years. We appreciate God using you at Browns. We appreciate him using you at the Bay Revival. We appreciate you so much keeping the faith. And I don't even think of it in terms like that. I think of it in terms as I'm headed to another world. And I want to bring my sheaves with me whenever I come. I'm watching out for your soul. And you know what? Sometime I may tell you something you don't want to hear. And sometimes I may tell you something that just sort of puffs you up and makes you a little bit mad. You walk out of here thinking, I'll never come back. He's crazy. But you're back. I said, but you're back. And the reason why you're back is because you know that I'll tell you the truth. The best I can see it. Amen? And I always will. If, when I can't tell you the truth, it's whenever I'll step down. So let me talk to you about the, the evil watchman. This is interesting. Song of Solomon. All night long, the lover said, the female lover said, I look for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but I couldn't find him. She said, I'll get up now and I'll go about the city and through its streets and squares and I'll search for the one my heart loves. So she looked for him, but didn't find him. The watchmen, the watchmen of Israel, were on the streets, and they found me as they made their rounds in the city, and they said, she said, have you seen the one that my heart loves? Look this way just for a minute, buddy. She was saying, have you seen my Lord? Asking the watchman, do you know where the Lord is? Do you know where my Savior is? you know where my Lord is? Have you seen the one my heart loves? And she said, scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. In other words, they weren't even able to lead her to her Lord. Look this way just for a minute. Everybody look this way just for a minute. The watchman in the city, when she came up to him, said, can you tell me where my Lord, my, my master is? Can you tell me where my lover is? And the watchman couldn't even give her direction how to find the one her soul loved. Let me say something to you. That scares me to death that the church can get in such a hellish shape that when people come in the doors and they say can you tell me where I can find the Lord and they have to leave the watchman in order to find their own Savior are you listening to me have to leave the house of God have to leave the church scarcely it said had I left look at this Scarcely had I left, put it back up on the screen, had I passed them by and they couldn't even direct me when I found the one my heart loves and I held him and I wouldn't let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house to the room where my mother conceived me. Now that's interesting. Let me just stop right there for a minute. People today are, after 911, people flock into churches and they knew it was God somehow. And they knew about David Wilkerson's prophecies and they knew about other people prophesying. 
And they knew this was an attack on America, and they knew that somehow it was spiritual, and people flocked into churches all across America. Wasn't even enough room in the parking places. People parked down the main boulevards and roads trying to get in the house of God. And when they came to the watchman, the watchman couldn't even lead them to the Lord. Couldn't even lead them to the Lord. Simple task. Couldn't even lead them to the Lord. Tell me, where is he? I don't know. I don't know. I think what you're looking for is a 10-step program at AA. We've had great results with AA here in our church. I think what you need is a counselor. I think what you need is a financial planner. And I think what you need is a psychiatrist that can give you some pills to help you sleep at night. Friend, <laughs> people don't need that. They've got enough of that. People are seeking the Lord. People are seeking Christ. And if they don't find him in the church, where are they going to find him? Look at this. There's evil watchmen. Couldn't even give directions to help her find her Lord. They're searching, they're looking, they're asking questions. What about Iran? What about Gaza? What, what's going on with Russia? She said, lead me to him. Now, look at the description. I love this. She describes the one she's looking for. Look at this on the screen. She said, my lover is radiant and ruddy. He stands out among 10,000. His head is pure as gold, and his hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like the doves by the water streams, washed in milk and mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. His arms are the rod of gold set with chrysolite. His body is like polished ivory decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold and his appearance is like Lebanon, the choicest of all the cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. My Lord is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. You know who she's talking about here? She's talking about Jesus before he's ever born the lover of my soul. She said, where is he? Where is he? Where is he, she said. And the watchman said, we don't know. We don't know who you're talking about. We haven't seen anybody like that. Look, look at me, everybody. Did you know religion has never really seen the Lord? Religion has never really seen the Lord. Religion sees buildings. Religion sees doctrine. Religion sees all these other things, and that's fine too, but they've never really had an experience with the Lord. People are saying, I don't care about the church building. I don't care about the name on the church. Just show me Jesus. Show me Jesus. Lead me to him, the lover of my soul. I got to give you one more place in the Song of Solomon before I go. This story's not over yet. She said this. God said this, let me, let me back up. I'm going I'm to go to Song of Solomon in just a minute, but let me just back up and tell you what God said about his prophets. Now, this is in Isaiah chapter 56. By the time God has appointed watchmen and they have failed so long in their, in their duty as being a watchman, here's how God sums up his watchmen. This is scary. His watchmen are blind. Look this way. You know what it means, Blind. In other words, his watchmen, they're called watchmen, but they can't see a thing. They can't see. And it said they're dumb dogs. They've lost the ability to even bark when they see danger. Let me ask you a question. What's the, what's the use of having a yard dog if he can't even bark when somebody pulls up? <laughs> Pardon me for being so abrupt there. But I mean, why would you want to feed a yard dog that can't even bark when somebody pulls up in the yard? Why would you feed him? Look at this. It said they can't even bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. 
They're greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they're shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain and from his own quarter. Come ye, say they, and I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. Interesting how God sees his watchmen in the last days. He says they're blind and they're dumb. They can't see and they can't even make a noise when something's wrong. Everything's dead quiet. Let me just interject this right quick. Now remember I told you before I got started, I said I'm not going to get political, but I just want you to listen to what I'm saying. I have never seen America in the place where we are right now. Never have. I saw the president last week when he came before the cameras in the press room. And it was built up to be that probably he was going to make a statement about Russia invading Ukraine. Because all morning long we had been seeing the pictures where there was troops now coming across the border into Ukraine. And then also he had been talking about the possibility of bombing Syria and dealing with ISIS in that axis of evil. So I just knew in that press conference, and I, I looked forward to it and I tuned in, I thought he was going to make a statement about Russia and I thought he was going to make a statement about bombing ISIS. He comes out. And when he said this, this is really where a lot of this stuff started in my heart right then. He said before ISIS and the world and this nation, we have no strategy. I've never heard a president talk like that before. I'm not saying I hate the president. I love him. But I've never heard such inadequacy in the face of such a threat. You cut on the TV the next day and the Prime Minister of England's on and he's in charge. And he's talking about raising the elevation, elevating the uh, alarm in the UK. And he's talking about this, that, and the other. But even that, as good as he did, he still pulled back from saying, this is radical Islam. I asked this question. Where's the urgency? The president didn't even say that Russia had invaded Ukraine. It said there was an incursion into Ukraine. And the foreign minister of Russia said, what you're seeing on the television is computer games. And they expect us to believe that. And you know what? It seemed like after he said it, and it was reported here in America, they backed off that story as if that was the truth. I have a question. With all this going on, with James Foley having his head lifted, with everybody on the internet to clearly see it, not with a sword but with a knife, and they cut his head off for the world to tune in and look at it. Anybody can tune in and look at it, cut his head off with a knife, and he bent right over and let him cut his head off. He had no other choice. And the president comes out and says, this is a terrible day and this is awful. And an hour later, he's out on the golf course. And while the boy's parents is having their press conference, the president is drawing back with his golf clubs and he's acting funny and he's saying, watch this. While they're having a conference talking about their son's head being lifted off. I have a question. Where? is the urgence. There is none. You hear me? There is none. There is none. And I have a question for you. If it's not here now, when do you think it's going to arrive? You know what's going to happen? It's going to get worse and colder as the days go by. And let me ask you this question. If the churches don't start crying out right now, deception is going to become so thick they'll never cry out. And preachers like myself 
And there's others out there, preachers like myself, they'll come in and take snippets of me preaching like this and plaster it on the air. And people will say, that crazy idiot, look at that fanatic. You see what I'm saying? So, let me give you this real quickly. I'm not finished with the Song of Solomon. Let me go there one more time. After she was with her lover, he had to get up and leave. And she missed him. So she goes back to the streets. And look at this. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but I couldn't find him. So I called him, but he didn't answer. And I went back to the streets, and the watchman found me as they made their rounds in the city. She comes up on the same watchman, and they beat me. They bruised me. They took away my clothes those watchmen of the wall. See, when she first went to them, they couldn't point her in that direction. But after she had had an experience with her lover and he left, she goes back to the streets of the same watchman and this time they're abusive. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. The closer you get to God, and the more of a relationship you have with Jesus if you don't come under persecution. Now, I want to say this to you. We're going to pray in just a few minutes, but let me just say this to you while I got your attention. I want to make it clear. If you think that all the persecution is going to remain in Iraq against the Christians and all the persecution is going to remain against the Coptic Christians in, our, in Egypt, and you think that all the persecution is going to remain in Iran against the born-again people, if you think that's all going to remain over there, you better think again. It's already coming into this country right now. Did you hear about the girl the other day in school? Somebody sneezed and she said, God bless you, and they sent her to the principal's office and expelled her for saying, God bless you. And they said, we will not have the name of God spoken in this classroom. Please hear me. This is already underway. It's already getting traction. And the closer we get to the coming of Christ, you're going to be persecuted also. You said, Brother Kilpatrick, will I face the sword? Will I face death? I don't know. I have no idea. But all I'm asking you is this. If you want to leave church now with somebody that won't even shake your hand, and you want to pout and leave the church because somebody didn't say hello to you, how are you going to keep... An, up with foot with horsemen whenever the horsemen begin to run. How are you going to keep up with them whenever the horsemen begin to gallop? You can't keep up with the footmen now. How are you going to keep up with that? Well, I'm going to leave the church because Brother Gilbert didn't shake my hand. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. I don't want to hear it. Shut up. I don't even want to hear it. That's childish. In the day that we're living in, you ought to be ashamed for thinking such a thing. It's time to grow up and be men and women of God and, and be in our post of duty. Can you shout amen? amen? It's time to quit ourselves like men and quit ourselves like women. And I want to tell you something else. It's time to find out where the prayer closet is again too. And what I want to do today is I'm going to close this service out and we're going to have a season of prayer. There's so much to pray about. We're not going to stay here long. But whenever I dismiss you in just a few minutes and we're going to have a season of prayer, Friend, I don't want to hear you just moping around here. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I want to hear you walking around here, and I want to hear you get passionate and start praying like God wants us to pray in this hour. The power is not in volume. You know, people can pray loud and turn me off. You know, it just turns me off to hear some people get loud because they think that's spiritual. I'm not wanting you to get loud. I'm just wanting you to get involved in what you're praying and pray like you really mean it. God knows when we mean something and when we don't mean something. He knows. He can look at us. He can hear us. You know, a mother can be in the house and she can be ironing and have a little baby at her feet, three years old, 
and that little baby just whimper and whine, well, mama don't pay no attention to it because the baby's fine, really. It's just in a bad way. But there's a cry that a baby can make. If it falls and hits its mouth or something, there's a cry that baby can make, and it's not a whining. It's a cry, and it gets that mother's attention. That mother will put that iron down, and she'll come right to that baby. That's a different kind of a cry. I think we're living in an hour now where the church needs to send up a different kind of a cry. We need to stop our belly aching, stop our whining, and start crying out to God like, this is really serious, Lord. We need to pray for Israel. We need to pray for Jerusalem. We need to pray for the people of God. We need to pray for America. We need to pray for the president. There's so much we need to pray for. Stand to your feet with me, if you will, please. Let's just praise him here for a minute. Come on, lift your voices. Shatori Kampando. Come on, let's just begin to praise him here for a minute. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to lift your voice, friend. Cry out to the Lord. Help me. I said I want you to cry out to the Lord. Urgent. Urgent. There's an urgency here. These are urgent times. Urgent things require urgent matters, urgent responses. Shitare samole biando na bokore biando, Henry Saravayanto. If you will, I want you just to begin to move out where you are. Let's make this a big prayer meeting, and I want you to begin to call on the Lord for America for our churches, for our ministries, for our president, for our military, for Israel, for Jerusalem. Come on, let's begin to cry out to the Lord. Just begin to move around if you want to. You can stay where you are, it doesn't matter. Come on. Those of you at home, help us pray, church. Come on, help us. Those of you at home, I want you to help me pray. Looking for you. 